Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I want to encourage you as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning, um, not only to join us, but uh, to remember all these things that we've been mentioning and talking about and singing about. So many people are hurting. So many people are lost. At the same time, it's so easy to encourage someone, and people need encouragement today. I mean, just about anything and everything that you can imagine, even in a congregation such as this, uh, you're experiencing so many uh, of, of the things that you just need some comfort and you just need some encouragement, some prayer, and some help for. As I'm going to mention, that's really one of the purposes of this table here, the Lord's table, um, and, and that God bids us, gives us the, the privilege, the honor to be able to come and sit with him at this table because he also knows what you're going through. He knows what every one of you is going through this morning. He knows your concerns, your anxieties, your hurts, your, your pain, your, your lostness, your loneliness, whatever it may be. And he gives us this tremendous privilege to join our hearts together as his church and to lift ourselves up before the throne of grace. Would you do that this morning with me? You may stand, you may kneel, you may just bow your head, you may come to the altar here. But let's go before the Lord in prayer this morning. Oh, Lord, we come before you, Lord, recognizing who you are, what you have revealed to us, where you are sitting right now and at the same time walking through your churches as they gather to worship you and your Father in the power and the love of the Holy Spirit. We truly are on holy ground, Lord. Human beings, Lord. We're just human beings, and we thank you that, that you know because of what your son did, of the feelings, of the experiences that we have here on this life, here on this earth. And So, Father, we come before you this morning, and we want to lay at your feet because you bid us to do that, to come and to yoke with you, to come and to lay your burdens down, our cares down, our fears down. We, we need to pray for wisdom this morning. We are in a nation that by other names are mentioned in the Old Testament. Nations that strayed from you and nations that were destroyed. Father, we lay our burdens down for... For those that may be in our own family that are lost, Lord, we've been praying and praying and praying for them, Father. But you haven't answered yet, Lord. Give us the strength and the hope and the courage to continue to pray. Father, for those that are battling a disease, God, give them peace, give them comfort. Troy's son, it's there in the hospital ward healing. Comfort Troy, comfort Sharon. Lord, for those that are facing results from tests, God, give them the peace that, that you as a great physician already know what those test results are. And they're going to be for your glory and they're going to be for our good. And sometimes we can't understand that, Lord. But we know when we can't understand it, your grace just fills us. Father, there may be some sin that needs to be laid down here this morning in the presence of Almighty God, especially before we come to this table, the Lord's table. God, if there's any unconfessed sin, we want to give it to you right now, Lord. Just at this very moment, Lord, take it from us. Lord, if it's an addiction or some other thing, take it from us, Lord. Give us the power your power to overcome it. Lord, if there's a family or families that are struggling financially, God, God, we ask you to provide what it is that they need. For marital situations that are struggling, just struggling because of marriage, God, we pray that you intervene and you just heal. Father, we thank you for the power of prayer. 
We thank you that you gave us the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, to live inside of each one of us. And so, Lord, that's another reason we know we're on holy ground this morning, because those of us who are saved brought the Holy Spirit, God Almighty, into this sanctuary this morning. So, Father, just some of our prayers that I spoke, but you know there are silent prayers that have gone up even as I've been praying, Lord. And we just thank you that you're interceding and taking our prayers vocally or silently and giving them to our Father. God, how blessed we are. We anticipate with great joy and great excitement of what you're about to do because your children have prayed as you have commanded us. And we thank you in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. God bless you, dear folks. Thank you for allowing us to, to pray together. If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, I want you to turn to two, two passages of Scripture. And, and you might want to pull out your outline there. But I want to look at Joshua chapter 5, first of all. And then I want to look at the passage of Scripture from Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I was reading a very interesting uh, story that, that has to do with a novel. And the novel had a, an interesting title. The, the novel was Ah, A-H, Ah, But Your Land is Beautiful. Ah, but your land is beautiful. And in this book, a man by the name of Alan Patton tells a story of another man by the name of Robert Mansfield, who was the headmaster of, uh, of a school in South Africa. And uh, this was during the days of apartheid there in South Africa. And it was days when apartheid was, was perhaps at, it, at its cruelest uh, height. Um, system of racial segregation that that sometimes as we consider scripture and consider where we are as Christians we, we often wonder how how could even of our ancestors ever had slaves but when Mansfield school was barred from playing and competing with another school that was black Mansfield finally had enough and he retired. He left. And as he gave up his position there, resigned his post, one of his friends, his closest friends, came to him, and he said, Robert, do you know what you have just done by resigning and standing against apartheid? He said, you know that you're going to be persecuted, and you're going to be wounded deeply. And Mansfield looked at him and he replied, and he pointed toward heaven. And he said, when I go up there, the big judge is going to say to me, where are your scars? Where are your scars? And if I say I don't have any scars, he's going to look at me and he's going to say, wasn't there anything worth fighting for for me down there? Wasn't there anything worth fighting for? Any battles of any significance? And he said, I don't want to face that question, that comment from the Lord, if he indeed makes such a comment. One day we are going to stand and we're going to see before Jesus, we're going to see his wounds. We're going to see his scars. We're going to see these things that we're coming to the Lord's table today to remember. You know, one of Christ's greatest battles, Christ's greatest battle, let me rephrase that, Christ's greatest battle, at least in my mind, was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we know the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. After they came out of the upper room, after participating in the Lord's table and singing a song, they went out across the Kidron Valley, and they went into the garden. And Jesus told them, three of them, he said, stay here. And he said, what? Watch and pray. He said that three times to them. And then Jesus went away, and he prayed. And the Bible says that he sweat blood. This was the fight 
that was coming from hell against Jesus Christ. It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. It wasn't on the cross. His battle was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And those that he brought around him to watch and to pray for them went to sleep. They went to sleep. They didn't pray. They didn't watch. And because they didn't pray and they didn't watch, when they came for Jesus, what happened to his closest people? He spent three years pouring his heart and his life and his soul into them to teach them. They all scattered. Every single one of them scattered. And there was Jesus Christ alone by himself. He won the victory in the Garden of Gethsemane so that when he went to the cross, it was already decided. He went to the cross willingly because God said, there is no other way, son, but to drink this cup of sin from your people. And I believe that's one of the reasons that, that we honor and, and come to the table this morning. It's one of the reasons why I believe power is so prayerful, uh, so prayer is so powerful. And it's one of the reasons I believe that when you look at Christ's church, Christ's people, there is so little prayer that is being used to change peace, uh, people and to change nations' lives and, and the direction that they're going. Because Satan knows the power of prayer. And Satan knows, we say this so often, Satan knows that when one of his children, one of Christ's children are praying to him, that God is going to answer that prayer. And most of the time, he'll answer that prayer in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. So we're going to remember today here what it cost Jesus Christ. But I want you to remember something else. You and I are members of what God calls the army of Christ. You and I, when we, wherever it was, whenever it was, said, Jesus, come into my heart, my life, and save me. You entered the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, as an army, an army is to keep peace. An army is to protect. An army is to do battle when that is necessary. And I believe that's what God expects of each one of us, not just a pastor, not a teacher, but I believe he expects this of each one of us. So I want to look at Joshua chapter 5, first of all, and I want to talk to you about strength and power for your battles. Strength and power for your battles. We're all in battles. Maybe some of you are in a respite right now. You're not in a battle right now. You've just finished one, or you know there's one coming up, or... One's going to just come out of the wild blue against you. But I want to tell you, there is strength and there is power in your battles because it is the power of Almighty God. Now listen to what, uh, what is recorded in Joshua chapter 5. Read along with me. I want to pick this up in verse 13. And when Joshua was by Jericho, remember they had crossed, uh, they had crossed the Jordan River and they were in there in Jericho now. And, and the writer says, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and he said, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, no. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now go back with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And follow along with me in verse 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing and he broke it and he gave it to the disciples and he said, take, this is my body. 
And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you that I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Heavenly Father, for just these few moments, open our hearts. Speak to us, Lord, right where we are. Some of us are in a battle. Some of us have come out of a battle. Some of us have been in a lot of battles. Many of us are scarred, hurt, maybe even fearful of another in Lord. But we seek your peace. We seek to be able to come to this table, your Lord's table, our Lord's table. And we just ask you to open our hearts and our ears. In Jesus Christ's holy name, Father, we pray. Amen. You know, all throughout Scripture, and we don't have time to, to turn to all these this morning, but, but all throughout Scripture, there's the image of, uh, of Christians being soldiers, soldiers for Jesus Christ. And I just happen to believe, and, and, and I'm really convinced in my belief in this, that soldiers, and when I say soldiers, I'm talking about Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, all those who at one point in time raised their hand and said, here I am, I will go for this nation. I am just absolutely convinced that there's a very special place in God's heart for soldiers. For those who have given their lives, for the families of those who have given their lives, I think there's a special place in their heart for those that may be up at our Army, uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center right now or some other medical center up in San Antonio that have given limbs, scarred, some beyond recognition. I believe there's a special place in God's heart, and I believe he's going to take care and is and has been taking care of soldiers. In Joshua chapter 5, he, he said, uh, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus Christ. He didn't say I'm Jesus Christ, but it was Jesus Christ, commander of the Lord's army, he said. Paul said in Philemon chapter 1, verse 2, in reference to Archippus, he said, my fellow soldier. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, he talked about Ephraim and he said, my brother, my fellow worker, my soldier. In 2 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 3, he said, Share in my suffering as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. So there's no doubt that in the context of Scripture that we are in the army of the Lord and we are to be soldiers, good soldiers in the army of the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we are in a spiritual army. And we are to do battle. And we are deployed in God's kingdom at this time of the ages. This is when and where that he placed us. Maybe it's not as bad as some other times that we read about in Scripture. Maybe it's worse in some cases. But for whatever reason, God chose to place us here as his fighters as his warriors, prayer warriors and otherwise, to be able to stand up, especially today in a nation that has lost its way, that a nation that, that is heading off the cliff, the cliff. And on November the 8th, we have another battle that's going to take place, and it, and it pains my heart to say and believe that there are going to be so many of Christ's soldiers that aren't going to fight the battle. They're not going to take time to take and see what the platforms of the parties are, and more importantly, what God's platform is, and then go into a voting booth and to pull that lever for Jesus Christ, for God and not what's behind your name or what's on your registration card. There are going to be soldiers for Jesus Christ that are going to do what, what we had a, a terminology in the military, stack arms. We stack our arms there in the midst of the soldiers and, 
and we rest. We don't pick up our weapons. This is a fight. This is a battle. This is a battle against evil today. I told someone this morning, I said, you know, one of the good things about getting old, older than some of you, I'm closer to being 30 years old in heaven than you are because that's the kind of body that I'm going to have up there. But until then, I want to be scarred for Jesus Christ. I want to stand against woke culture. This little girl, these children, they're right here. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's not going to have that much of an effect on me or someone my age today. This battle is for our kids. And if we are not going to stand up in the voting booth and vote out those who have taken this nation to where it is today, then I'm just asking, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? We are soldiers in the army of the Lord, and here is our battle plan. And this is what God has called us to do and called us to be. Sodom and Gomorrah has nothing on us in America if you want to read what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, what was going on there. They have nothing compared to where, where many of our leaders in America today has taken this nation. And so we need to stand. This is ultimately for our future generations. Listen, as much or more than ever, we need the Lord's strength, and we need the Lord's power to stand and to be what Christ has called us, blessed us, and enlisted us to be for him. So I want to look here in your outline. There are two important reminders about the Lord's table, two important reminders, and I want to talk about very quickly the purpose of the Lord's table. I'm going to go through here relatively, uh, relatively quickly this morning because it's important when we go to the Lord's table that we're not rushing. We, we spend too much time rushing during the week um, to, to, to do and to be what God has called us to do. But the importance of the Lord's table, two reminders, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, you and I are sitting with Jesus spiritually at his table. The Bible says that wherever Two or more are gathered in his name, there Jesus is. The Bible says in Psalm chapter 23, verse 5, that Jesus prepares a table for us in the presence of what? In the presence of whom? In the presence of our enemies. If you are seeking to be a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're seeking to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ, there is a demon out there that's got his weapon trained on you, waiting to see if there is a crack in your armor, the armor of God that Paul talks about. That's just not a, a, a nice passage to pray and uh, to read and to remember. That's a serious passage. Satan only needs a crack in your armor. And so we who seek to, to do the mission that God sent us to do, we have a target on our back, so to speak. We have a target on us. I want you to turn to Acts chapter, 40, uh, chapter 2 for just a moment. Acts chapter 2. And listen to what uh, Luke says in, in Acts here. In Acts chapter 2, <coughs> look at, at it with me in verse 42. Chapter 2, verse 42. And this is talking about the fellowship of the believers. The, a, a, a church, and if you read this, it is a praying church. We know that the church was a praying church at that time. And in verse 42 of Acts, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, and to do what? to the breaking of bread and prayers. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. 
the breaking of bread, the Lord's Supper, partaking of the Lord's Supper. Why were they doing that? Because they were remembering what Jesus Christ, the one that they knew, many of them, and followed. They were remembering the cost of what it cost Jesus Christ to die for them and then for the Holy Spirit to come upon them. Turn back to chapter 20 of this same letter of Acts. Chapter 20. And listen to what Luke records here in verse, uh, verse 7. Chapter 20, verse 7. And on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together, did you catch that? On the very first day of the week, when we were gathered together, the church was gathered together to do what? To break bread. To do what? To remember what Jesus Christ had done and the sacrifice that they had made. And Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. And it goes on and on there, to breaking bread. In other words, the Lord's Supper was the main focus of that church at that time. They came together to worship. And the first thing that they did is they remembered the Lord by taking the bread and the cup in whatever form that that took. Remembering Christ's death every week. And, and a church, why the church? Why do church do that so often? You know, we do have churches today that, that do the Lord's Supper every week. When I was growing up, I was in, in a denomination that did it every week and didn't mean anything to me. Didn't mean anything to me because I wasn't a Christian at that time. Um, but it didn't mean anything because it just seemed like it was just rote. As I looked at people, it was just, it was just rote. They, they, they just did that every week. But this is huge. The early church did it because they were spiritually starved for the Lord. They were spiritually starved if they were not at the Lord's table because it was at the Lord's table that they were remembering and they're remembering some of the things that Jesus said, and it gave them strength, and it gave them hope, and it gave them comfort. We are living and fighting in a world that is filled with evil. It just is. And we need the Lord's strength, and we need the Lord's power to be able to stand up against the forces that Satan is throwing against us, our families, and our nations today. The woke culture, the counterculture. The Marxist culture, the humanist culture that is trying to win the battle and take Jesus Christ and his word more and more and more out of our nations, of our schools, of our universities. And you know that. So when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're sitting with Jesus at his table. Secondly, the Lord's Supper reminds us of our mission and why we're here. It reminds us of our mission and why we're here. And our mission is to tell someone about Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ means to us. It means that our mission is to stand against politicians, to stand against educators, to stand against the, the evil that they're bringing into our libraries for our children and into our universities, and to stand and tell them about Jesus Christ. And yes, there will be persecution, but praise God. Praise God if you get scarred, a scar. Praise God for that. We need to be able to stand on, in, and throughout the Word of God. Every, every word of it is, is true. Every word of it is powerful. And when we stand for Jesus Christ, the commander of the Lord's army, the Holy Spirit, will speak through us. He'll give us the words to speak. He'll give us the strength to stand in the face of opposition and to stand for Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this morning, 
that somebody that uh, uh, that that is going to give a uh, about a two minute uh, testimony of of when they could have been aborted they they were about to be aborted but then God intervened and and that person is going to give in in the very near future a, a two minute two and a half minute testimony of of what that means. I want to ask you this morning, can you tell, give a testimony in a minute and a half of what Jesus Christ means to you? If somebody comes up to you, we had a kid out here, we mentioned that several times, talked to our chairman of the deacons playing basketball out there, and chairman of the deacons said, where do you go to church? He said, what's church? I've never been to church. Can you tell them in a minute and a half what Jesus, who Jesus Christ is and what he means to you? I think that's one of our purposes. Second, we are here because Jesus Christ died to forgive our sins and to save us and to change our lives. Are your, is your life being changed by the power of Almighty God, by what he did on the cross, by placing the Holy Spirit in us? Is your life being changed? Are you finding yourself in more battles if you're not being attacked in some way? You need to take a look at what you're doing. Because it is true, when you're in combat, you're going to get shot at. And you're going to be doing some shooting. That's just warfare today. You know, Sarah Miles wrote this in a novel. She said that in her memoir, she said, and the memoir was called, Take This Bread. And she shares how the first time she took communion and it changed her life forever. She said, one early cloudy morning, I went, when I was 46 years old, I walked into a church and I ate a piece of uh, bread and took a sip of wine. She said it was a routine Sunday, a routine Sunday activity because tens of millions of Christians do this all the time. And she said, except until this moment, it wasn't routine for me anymore. She said, I was fed up by life, and I was thoroughly fed up with this secular life and at best this indifference to religion because I saw other Christians and what they claimed to be. And she said, I was often appalled by fun and to become a part of the body of Christ and ask Christ to come into my life. And she said, I realized at that moment that I had been doing with my life all along what I was meant to do now for God, and that was to feed people. And so I did. I took communion, I passed the bread to others, and then I kept going, and, and I was compelled to find new ways to share Jesus Christ with others when I left that church. That's one of the purposes that we meet and remember what Jesus Christ did for us. Well, what about the purposes? Very quickly here, five purposes of the Lord's Supper. And, and there's a, a misconception. There is a misconception, and I know this is true because of the, the technology that we have today, the, the live stream um, broadcast that we do. There's a misconception on, and, and Christian, some Christians, that they don't need church. They, they don't need church. But I believe that, that that thought, that belief, is straight from the gates of hell. No, it's straight from hell. We need church. And I want to show you here why we need church. Why we as the army of the Lord need to gather. The the, the New Testament, when, when they met, some of the verses that we looked at, when they met, they came together as a church, and they participated as a church. That's God's intent, that we come together as a church, and he'll be there, and we participate in the elements there. And there's a purpose for that. Number one, as soldiers for Christ, we've come together to prepare for battle. That's what we're doing right now. Maybe God's word being spoken through this human being Maybe God's word is touching you in some place that you're going to need that word to be able to stand in the next battle or maybe in the battle that you're in right now. But we come together to prepare for battle. We, we draw strength from each other. We draw encouragement from each other. We, we, 
we pray for each other. We compliment each other. We lift each other up. That's a purpose, uh, one of the purposes of the church. And we need this strength in both physical and both mental battles. And we're all experiencing at one point or another physical and mental battles. We come together to lift one another up. Secondly, the purpose of the church, uh, the purpose of the Lord's Supper is as soldiers for Christ, we gain strength from numbers and power from our unity. There's power in the unity. I, I don't know if you're aware of this. I am as your pastor. It hasn't always been this way. But there is power that God is using now because of the unity of this church. It just is. It's not about size. It's about the unity and the love that God sees in this church. And God is, is blessing this church. Listen, we're, when you try to fight alone, that's the most dangerous situation you can ever be in. We don't fight alone as the army of God. We fight with the army of God. That's you and me. What does that mean? That means I cover your back, you cover my back. You pick me up when I get wounded, and I'll pick you up when you get wounded. When you hurt, I hurt. And I'll pray for you. And when I'm hurting, I want you to pray for me. When you can't even take that next step, I want, I want to lift you up with the Word of God, and I want to lift you up physically with God's Word. We are to minister to each other. We are to encourage each other. And one of us, when one of us begins to stray, we need to go after that person and bring them back into our camp, into the Lord's camp. There's a third purpose of the Lord's Supper, and that's to remind us of the necessity to individually examine ourselves before we eat and before we drink at this table. I want to look at one passage of Scripture from First Letter of Corinthians, the First Letter of Corinthians. Listen to what Paul wrote to the church of Corinth in First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself or herself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why so many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. I believe that to be true in every aspect of what, what Paul wrote there. God wouldn't have told him to write that if he didn't mean it, every word of that to be true. There are some people who are sick that shouldn't be sick. There are some people I believe that have died that probably should not have died if you take this word seriously. But I want you to remember something. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what you may be involved in, there is forgiveness at this table. There is the grace that we talked about last week at this table. God's unmerited favor, favor amazing grace. He'll pour it down upon you as much and more than perhaps than, than you'll ever need. And there is God's comfort and peace and change in your life that we can receive here at this table. Fourth purpose. The Lord's table is to remind us of the cost and to never take the Lord's table for granted. Don't ever take the Lord's table for granted. Forgiveness, salvation, eternal life. Everything when you said at that moment, Christ come into my heart, everything in the power and the strength of Almighty God and the blessings of Almighty God were yours. They were mine. We have to access them. 
God says, ask. God says, there's nothing you have to fear. For I'm with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. What is it that you need? Pray. Because you're in my army. And my son, Jesus Christ, as your commander and the commander of the Lord's army, gave his life for you and for me so that you might have forgiveness and have eternal life. Don't take that for granted. And then fifthly, finally, the gospel. This gospel here. Christ's death on the cross assures us that we will never experience the wrath of God because Christ took his Father's wrath that was meant for us because of our sin upon himself. That's why Jesus sweat blood when he prayed not once not twice but three times to the father if there's any other way if there's any other way father take this cup from me i don't know of a better commander there is no better commander than to be able to align with the commander of the lord's army jesus christ himself and i just want to say this in closing we talked about this last week. And dear people, I want to remind us, as we go to the Lord's table this morning, we don't have any time in this life to play games with God. We don't have any time in this life to play games with His Scripture. We don't have any time to leave from here today when there are people who are hurting, people who are lost, People that are seeking power, maybe to change things for good, maybe not to change things for good. We don't have a moment of life to waste in not following Jesus Christ, the gospel, the word of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh Lord, our Heavenly Father God, I pray. I pray for your strength. I pray for your power. I pray for the change of direction, not only in this nation, because that is people. Nations are made up of people. I pray for the change of direction for some of your soldiers that, that may not be participating in this great battle here on earth. I pray, Father God, for someone here this morning that can't with assurance say, I am saved. And I know that whenever Christ takes me home, I will be with him in heaven forever. And I pray, Father, for his one person that can't say that assuredly. And I pray that during this invitation, your invitation, they will hesitantly come forward and just speak to me. I'm that one that you just spoke about, preacher. And I want to be saved. I want to be sure. Father, for someone here this morning that is looking to join this army of the Lord that we call Pine Drive, and Father, our arms are open. Let them also just come forward and say, I want to do battle with this church as it lifts me up, lifts my family up, whatever it may be, Lord. Father, for some, before we come to the Lord's table, that just need to pray, need that power of prayer in their life to give them strength to do, to make the decision that they know they have to make, God. And Father, this is your invitation. We're not going to drag this out, Lord. We're not going to drag this out. We either... We either accept what Jesus Christ may be placing on our heart or we reject it. Satan does not want us to respond, Lord, but you do because you wouldn't give this invitation if it wasn't from you. So, Father, we thank you for what you're about to do before we come here to the Lord's table and to remember. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as our praise team leads us? in our invitation, and then we're going to go to the Lord's table here this morning. Prepare your hearts now.